your thing. Okay. So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for April 21st, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at her discretion and after consult consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person meet committee excuse me, an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, would you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee? Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Here. Thank you. And for the record, would you just call Mr. Offerman's name? Sure. Mr. Offerman? Okay, thank you. And then Ms. Cox, would you also call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Yes. Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Holmes? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Parandozzi? Present. Dr. Elmendorf? Present. Mr. Conley? Present. Ms. Ferguson? Present. And we also have Ms. Lanza? Present. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other um, board members or staff members? Yes, we have Ms. Lanza. Oh, that's you. Okay. Anybody else other than Ms. Lanza? Yeah, there's more. Ms. Schumacher? Okay. Present. Ms. Web Wendland? Present. Ms. Hernandez? Present. Dr. Sullivan? Present. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Cox. At this point, I am going to turn the meeting over to Dr. McComas for um, consideration of instructional materials as new business. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Yes, yes, thank you um, members of the committee and welcome. Um, today's agenda, we are reviewing materials for instruction um, in, in advance of contracts so that you understand what the instructional need is um, and how we use these resources. Um, so at least one of these is a name change um, and so it's, it's a uh, the team will talk through each one of these. Um, there is a change to today's agenda. One of the items I thought was um, going to be coming forward uh, for this today was uh, letter C, the Science Biology High School textbook. That actually, we, uh, we will not be addressing that one today. I anticipate that should be in our next meeting. Um, and so uh, with that's the only change to, to today's agenda. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to invite Ms. Shea. All of these do fall under Ms. Shea's leadership. And so she will facilitate moving from one um, instructional resource to the next. And so at that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Shea. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Um, mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Chair Mack, members of the board and fellow members of uh, CNI. Thank you for having us this afternoon. Um, Mr. Corns, are you able to bring up the presentation? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, so as Dr. McComas shared, we're here today um, as part of our practice to bring forward any upcoming materials that will be coming before the Contracts Committee and the full board for approval that relate to instruction. Next slide. So the first contract that we're going to be talking about today is actually a contract modification. This contract is a current contract that su supports uh, digital library resources that include multidisciplinary research databases. Um, so this contract covers uh, a few different ProQuest online databases that are used to supplement the research process in multiple um, courses. So we've included a couple of data points based on feedback we've gotten from the committee in the past, including the cost per pupil as well as the usage how we um, how frequently the most current data usage and I'm joined here today by our coordinator of library media Amanda Lanza um, so I'll give a brief overview and then I'll invite um, Miss Lanza if there's anything that she wants to add so the first database supports students in K through 12 it's called culture grams it's a cultural reference 
Reference Database that features information of over 200 countries, as well as each of the US states and 13 Canadian provinces. It includes, among other things, additional content for research, as well as authentic video and audio of native language speakers. This content is referenced in uh, different curricular resources across contents, including social studies and ELA, but it is also a part of the research database when students are doing independent research projects through library media. We also have SIRS Discover, which is a research online research database that specifically serves students in six through eight. It is a way for us to help curate resources that are hand selected and curated from over 2000 newspapers, magazines and different government primary and secondary source documents. Um, you can see I skipped over culture gram. The cost per pupil is 37 cents per year. Um, to date, we've had 336,221 pages viewed by students. Um, the SIRS Discover is 68 cents per pupil per year, where we've had 40,154 or full text views this school year. Next slide. And then the third of these ProQuest databases is the SIRS Issues Researcher that is primarily used by our high school students. Uh, the cost for that is a dollar two cents per pupil with over 170,000 full text views this year. Um, again, this is a general reference database, but it's curated and updated daily to reflect changes in current events and science. So part of the general purpose of having these curated research databases is also around helping our students to develop research skills with sourcing, but to do so in a way that we know is a high quality vetted curated resource. So uh, moving away from Wiki Wikipedia, if you will, or just using Google, but really teaching students um, how to do some searches in a general reference database, but one that we know has been curated to reflect those leading issues for students. All of the databases that I've just described include many different features for accessibility, including closed captioning, and um, in some cases a read aloud feature for students who are researching content that might exceed their individual reading ability, as well as transcripts for um, accompanying videos. And um, many of the databases include PDF versions of nonfiction ebooks um, that can be downloaded and utilized for further resource and research. Um, we reference there the alignment to our compass, focus area one learning accountability and results. Certainly our teaching and learning framework expects our students with high expectations as well as culturally relevant pedagogy to have opportunities to research across different contents um, and of course supports disciplinary literacy. So Ms. Lenz, I know I went very quickly, but you're our resident expert. Is there anything that you would like to add that I did not include? Thank you. Um, I just also want to mention that all three of these ProQuest databases also provide support for our students to properly cite their sources. Um, so they will provide those um, citations for our students as well. So part of our digital citizenship. Thank you. Very important scout. With that, we open it to any questions for members of the board. Mr. Thomas or Ms. Causey? Oh, Mr. Thomas, I see your question. Go right ahead. Thank you so much and thank you for this presentation. Um, one of my questions goes to the per people funding. And um, when it says one dollar and two cents for uh, per people for search issues researcher, is that only for the ninth through twelfth grade students that we are, are, are being charged for? So it's not all one hundred eleven thousand. So what we try to do with the per pupil, that's a great question. Thank you for the question. We actually, so the I mentioned that the contract is coming because we're looking for a modification. So in the contracts committee, what we'll be asking for is an increase of $140,000 total. And so what we try to reflect is take the total cost for each of these databases divided by the number of students that would have access to them. So they don't actually charge us per pupil. We have system licenses, but we try to contextualize that because of the volume of students we serve in a, in a way that is meaningful meaningful based on the per pupil allocation. OK, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And how it do will students send us a bill for a dollar two if we enroll in, student <laughs> in 10th grade, Perfect. but it's just to try to give you um, perspective. Thank you. And uh, how are students accessing these resources? 
Great question. So I'm going to start and then I'll invite Ms. Lanza. So some of these resources are directly linked into the curriculum. So we have several of our PBAs in our ELA curriculum that will reference these databases. So then they're linked directly through um, Schoology. Um, it's also a part of some of our online research models and the AP capstone, as well as I know Ms. Lanza referenced the digital citizenship curriculum that's taught through those um, school library media specialists. Um, Ms. Lanza, is there anything you want to add about um, access? And then all students have access to the My Apps portal to access all the BCS digital content, which would include the ProQuest databases. Awesome. And one last thing, um, I think I have used resources one time uh, from my sixth through 12th grade experience, but I can remember. And that was in my a middle school library class when we were learning about Cornell Notes in the Media Center and we were using SIRS to really do a lot of research. So I'm wondering, what are some ways to then help or to try to engage students to use these resources more often because I know how incredible they are, but I think a lot of us are going to Google and Wikipedia most of the time instead of using these resources. So how are we trying to get more students to use the resources that we have available to them? So it's a great question. I'll start and again ask Ms. Lanza to join in. So um, you may also have been using these resources and not known it because oftentimes the teachers access these resources and build it into their content. So some of the page views that we see are actually one teacher either downloading some of these nonfiction uh, resources and linking them or including the link within their lesson plan in Schoology. So you may actually have accessed it more than you referenced, although you were taught explicitly how to research it yourself. In terms of increasing access um, for students we agree that the resources are really rich and robust, so we continue to try to support it through um, the library media lessons around digital citizenship and citations. Um, Google is just easier, right? And so we know that students are going to be drawn to do that first, um, but what we are trying to continue to do is help to teach students to see the value in the efficiency of actually having a high quality resource that you can cite. Um, and that comes through those different experiences of the research built into the curriculum. So Ms. Lenz, I don't know if you want to talk about anything else specifically, but we're trying to, um, it's okay for Google to be a starting point. It's not okay for it to be the ending point. And I think that's part of what we try to continue to underscore with students. So then they eventually learn it actually is more efficient to go directly to a research database since Google winds up creating many more steps before you get to one that is of high quality. But Ms. Lenz, is there anything that you would add? I think our continued work with the content offices, especially during the curriculum writing um, piece, which um, Ms. Shea talked about the online research models and slam dunks, that's in partnership with our library media specialists and our content offices to hand select out of our curated digital content, which resources would be the most appropriate for a specific topic. So that goes back to what Ms. Shea was also saying that sometimes we're already helping to select some of those specific resources for students instead of asking them to go directly to a resource. Um, but having that resource available in the My Apps means that any curious student who just wants to know more about a topic has access to that just over spring break, which we just were, or you know during the summer. So embed it through the curriculum and then also have accessibility for student curiosity and interest. Okay, thank you. Ms. Causey, do you have any questions? If you do, yes. you're muted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I had um, requested previously and um, earlier uh, that the contract spending authorities related to prior contracts be attached to board docs and um, because I think that's very helpful and can make the meetings more efficient uh, without having to ask questions where the information is readily available and also in terms of increasing transparency um, and engagement with our communities that they would also see that. Um, so you had in the um, agenda somewhere, oh no, on the on the PowerPoint, you had put in the uh, contract. So, so I guess the question is, what is the process to consider those to be attached? Is that the chair of the committee? Is that, does the committee need to take a vote? Yeah, so I, I will say, Ms. Causey, and thank you. I saw you had sent an email just uh, just a little while ago um, sharing what you had just shared as well. Um, what I will need to do is the, um, I know you had talked about the draft of upcoming ones. I certainly can go back um, and look at how do we make it more convenient for 
um, all of you to find the uh, um, what did you say the the previous ones, the prior ones that are already public information. So I'll I'll go back and and work with Miss Goover to figure out how to make it because uh, I appreciate your point of you're all very busy. And so how do we pull package that together for you? I will go back and talk to Miss Goover about how do I um, go back and find those previous ones that are already public to make them available. I would need to talk with uh, Dr. Williams and the uh, uh, those who run contracts committee uh, because of any of their things that are not yet published, right? So, because I can't do the work of contracts here, but but I appreciate your point of how do we pull those things together for an efficient package for all of you to sort of see it all in one context. So, um, so I will go back and and see what I can do on um, on those two pieces of finding out how do I package those ones that are already public for you and pulling them together. Um, and then uh, talk with um, Dr. Williams and our new chief financial officer about those draft versions that you're requesting. OK, because the prior versions are available on board docs. Right, because they come right. to the board. So that's how I'm looking them up right. through board docs. And um, thankfully, uh, when the cyber attack occurred, board docs is in the cloud managed by their yeah. organization. So all of those um, documents are still there. And, and what's actually important to consider is not to put in a link because the links can be broken, but to put in the actual document, attach the actual document. Yeah. Um, and if it wants to have a link, you know, just to ensure where people knew where it was publicly available. Sure. But it, 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 it is an efficient and effective way to uh, provide this committee with information, but also the public. And um, so we've had these discussions and I'm hoping we can actually make a change. Um, it was also brought up in public works related to the board receiving uh, sufficient full information in a timely manner ahead of meetings in order to make them all more efficient. So sure, that's and, thank, and I'll just say thank you, Miss uh, Kazi. I'll just say as well, I'll be genuine in that I had um, sincerely in my thinking been thinking you were asking for those sort of draft contracts that really weren't yet once i when i saw what you had put in writing certainly as you said anything that's already released i could certainly work to try to package more effectively for you so i'll just own that i really had been focused on those forward ones so but the but the future ones are also there's also ways to do that we do that with many other things. So Ms. Sure. Mack, thank you for that time. Uh, yeah. the other quick question I had is what is the distinction of the board approving these sorts of library resources and um, approving other book materials that are ordered for circulation in libraries? I'm not sure I understand the question. I was told recently regarding a situation with a potentially um, with a book that community members objected to and there was a review occurring that the board does not approve um, individual books that are ordered by library media specialists for circulation. Right, so I think what you're referencing is the executive summary that we submitted about the um, policy and rule that governs the selection of the library collection which is yeah. different than 6002. So the main distinction is that this resource that we're talking through is for system wide use. An individual title in a library collection is not under 6002 because it's not instructional content approved for system wide use. And so that's the main distinction. So because these are databases that are used system wide for all students um, in the curriculum, that's why they would fall under 6002 and that's why we're bringing them here today. OK, and then you differentiated between the grade levels because uh, is that because there is more developmentally appropriate content yes so there is a, you'll see yes exactly so you'll see in the note with the age appropriate resources and we roster them accordingly too so if a student in kindergarten tried to access their SIRS issue researcher they would not be rostered to that so there is some tiering um, based on the content and the age appropriateness as you described that's great. That's really good to hear. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you very much. I have just quick questions. Um, Ms. Shea, you mentioned one of them. I think it's the SIRS issue researcher was changed daily. 
or could change daily. Is that the same for the middle school? Um, I'm, I'm specifically wondering, would would this database have um, trending news about like Ukraine? Yeah. Right, so I'm going to again invite Ms. Lanza to correct me if I'm wrong, but the SIRS issue researcher specifically is around evolving topics, so that's the one that updates daily. If you go back a slide, um, Mr. Corns, the um, culture grams, which is the K-12, to and then uh, the SIRS researcher, I think, is um, has a different purpose because it's mostly about research on sort of static content. Um, so I, I can't say for sure that it doesn't update, but I can say specifically the goal of issues researcher, and you can kind of tell from the name, the purpose of that is to curate that evolving more current content. So that's the one that would focus on something like the evolving crisis and war in Ukraine. Okay, and that, is it Miss Lanza or Lanza? I don't. I want to say your name right. Lanza, thank you. L Lanza, okay. Um, I taught English at the community college, and one of the biggest challenges for me was helping my students understand the various components of citations, whether it be APA or MLA. Um, I know because I visited a school and a wonderful media specialist gave me an overview of SIRS issues. She showed showed me how those points were populated. Does that also take place in the middle school version? All three of them have the citation that students would be able to copy and incorporate into any of their research um, or papers. All three of them would. And is there any explanation in that system of of each component of a citation? Um, and I may be dating myself here. Maybe kids never have to know the components and never have to manually do it anymore because of this. But um, I, I just remember t telling my students that periods matter, that the the comma matters, that um, how you show the page number, the page number range. Are students today, and maybe Mr. Thomas can jump in here, ever called upon to, to cite a paper without a tool? Go ahead, Go ahead, Mr. Thomas. Head, Mr. Thomas. <laughs> I would say for the Take most part, uh, we can use a tool. However, last year in my AP English class, we had to cite them by hand and uh, manually type them. So I think it depends on the teacher, um, but uh, sometimes there are those things you can use on Google that show you the citation makers, but I, I wish I had um, known more about SIRS so that I could use those for my citations. What I was actually going to say to you, Mr. Thomas, to your question, how do we make kids use this? I think if, if people realize that all they had to do was go to the article and hit the button and it would populate on their paper, they might be using it more. It does um, help. <laughs> because it was a big sticking point for my students. And then my last question, I ask this often is, my students used a database called Opposing Viewpoints. Um, does this play that role at all? Do we have any databases where our students can pick a topic and they're entrenched in their belief, but then go to Opposing Viewpoints and read well thought out op opposition? Opposing Viewpoints doesn't exist really anymore what they've done is they've merged that into that SIRS issues researcher okay that's what i okay that's yeah, what i want to stay know. away from having opposing viewpoints because then it makes it sound like it has to be one side or the other this is part of the language that they provide about the database instead they try to provide um resources that would show different viewpoints that's right uh, yeah a broad range of viewpoints with again making sure that they're all vetted resources that are you know reliable and come from resources that we would consider being something that our students would find valuable and okay. to your point miss mac it does group them the way miss lonzo was describing so if you're researching a topic it will curate from multiple perspectives and multiple sources that tend to have a particular lens through which they're viewing a current event so that students can experience that same idea but trying not to make it a binary that you either have to think this way or this way, but rather understand that there's multiple perspectives. OK, thank you. Um, so do I have a motion to approve ARA? Well, yeah, ARA 21019. So move, Thomas. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Uh, Ms. Cox, wait, may we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. 
And it looks like on my list that the next item um, is the math and science supplementary supplies and equipment. And I believe Ms. Shea, I'm just going to keep calling your name. You are today, sorry to say, um, but I do have friends with me today. So Eric Cromwell, our elementary science coordinator is here as well as our director of science. Um, and he certainly can share what kinds of materials we buy with this um, contract, specifically around our um, science kits and some of our expo um, exploratory materials. However, I do want to make a note. The reason this contract is coming forward is really a name change. Um, so we're not changing spending authority or the terms of the contract, um, but really changing the name of the Lakeshore Equipment Company um, to Lakeshore Learning Materials LLC. Um, however, if you had curiosity about what kinds of supplementary supplies, some of you were on the committee when we brought this in May of 2020 and we described some of the different resources that we purchased in our science kits to support our curriculum as well as some of the math materials. Um, but certainly Mr. Cromwell and Ms. Schumacher are here if you had any other questions, but this particular contract is really coming forward as a name change. So you actually answered the only question I had. How did this differ from the contract where we had the science and math kits? You got it. Just any okay. change. I don't okay. have any questions. Mr. Thomas, Ms. Causey. Okay. Uh, may I have a motion to approve JBO 71420? I think you're muted. So moved, Thomas. May I have a second? Second, Causey. Ms. Cox, could you do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. OK, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Our next item is textbooks and instructional materials. Ms. Shea? Yes, Mr. Corns, if you can move past this slide, this is the one that we have. There we go. Perfect. So um, again, members of the committee who have been with us a while and members of the board will reference this um, contract. We've been here multiple times. Um, this is the very large textbooks and instructional materials contract. And what this does is it allows for and it's assigned to about a dozen different vendors. And essentially what happens is um, schools and offices use this contract to purchase a wide range of books, some of which are textbooks, specifically if we're doing replacement textbooks. So for example, um, in previous years, the um, geometry textbook that we had prior to moving to illustrative math, if a student had to um, replace a textbook or schools were purchasing additional copies, it would fall under this. Um, this also covers some of our um, library books that Ms. Causey referenced earlier, as well as novels. So um, you'll remember in curriculum committee, we will often bring forward novels that have been approved, especially in our efforts to make the curriculum more culturally responsive. If a department chair is replenishing or replacing some copies of that novel, or if the Office of ELA is purchasing sets of novels, um, all of those would fall under this contract. Um, we are coming forward, it is not a new contract, but we are coming forward with an increase in spending authority. You may recall at the um, one of our budget meetings, I believe Dr. Hager had asked the question about how we have really worked to bring together funds into more of a centralized textbook um, fund. So our annual um, predicted spending authority or purchase um, budget amount for textbooks in general is about $3 million. Um, and that is an average over the last several years. Um, we are anticipating this year to be a little bit higher because of course Rossville Elementary School, we're buying a whole lot of materials. Um, and so anytime we have a new school, we anticipate having an increase. And so um, I know Ms. Causey, you didn't have the um, opportunity to have the old um, handout. So I will share with you that the previous contract spending authority was 10 million. The modification that we'll be seeking for the next year is that 3 million that I referenced that we have budgeted each year. Um, and uh, the other piece that I just want to note is that this contract is used, as I said, it falls under uh, the Department of Teaching and Learning, but the spending is used by schools as well as other offices in the division. So uh, one in particular office that uses this contract quite a bit is the Office of Title I. So as 
schools utilize Title I funds to purchase materials for classrooms, uh, professional learning for teachers, anything that would um, require um, textbooks or instructional materials would also fall under this contract. Um, the one distinction that I want to make, and perhaps I'm anticipating some of your questions, um, oftentimes when we have a new purchase, so for things like bridges or open court, just to use two recent examples, you know those purchases have their own contract. And so um, we usually would use that contract when we're purchasing those particular textbooks. However, for a really long time, as we would bring on new textbooks, once it was a part of our system, and then we move towards replenishment um, or just upkeep. If a student lost a material and they were being asked to replace it, then those titles get moved into um, this contract. So this is really um, how we use local booksellers, whether it's um, Barnes and Noble or some of our Pearson Scientific or um, several other vendors to replace or replenish materials. Um, it's not used for like an initial purchase the way that bridges or illustrative math is used. I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions. Sure. Um, do we ever inventory what exists in schoolhouses today? This is a great question, and Ms. Dr. McComas is smiling because she and I just had a meeting about inventory. Um, yes, well, I swear I didn't have any insider information. You might have. But every time not, I, not, not, I see right rooms of books, and the, it never it never seems to change. So. So there's a couple of things. So um, we actually are renewing our efforts and Ms. Lanz, I think logged off or she might still be here around how we do physical inventory as well as the digital inventory, for example, of library collections. So we're embarking on a process that would have a three year cycle. Um, we do barcode things like, for example, the Wonders um, materials when that was a, a very large purchase. We did barcode all of those textbooks and we do inventory those textbooks. Um, and then it also has become a part of the practice for new schools. So we were just having a conversation about purchasing barcode materials um, for Rossville. Um, and so yes, and um, there are definitely other materials that have been in school buildings for a really long time that had not been inventoried. So schools often um, engage in a um, process themselves. So I mentioned how department chairs as a part of their responsibility factor, uh, they do count in their book rooms. So as they're looking at different novels that maybe they have passed out to students or they have assigned, uh, they have their own system of inventory. Um, and we do also have the Destiny um, program has the capacity for system-wide inventory, which is what we use, for example, for wonders. Um, so I would say it's a yes and. So that was actually a follow up question when you mentioned barcodes was what system are we using to there's no sense having a barcode if you don't have a system right. to scan it's destiny. And inventory destiny has the capacity and that's what we've used for like the wonders purchase or for the new schools like Honeygo or and now Rossville. And then my second question is and I, I've asked this before. So this is a a contract against which people can buy. Correct. But they can't direct bill against this contract, correct? If I'm a principal at a school, whatever I buy is coming out of my schoolhouse budget. So the funds are coming from your school budget, but the spending authority is spent against this contract. So when a school submits, so if you were principal of an elementary school and you wanted to buy 30 copies of a professional development book for your staff, you would with your school develop a purchase order and say I want to buy 30 copies of where the crawdads <laughs> we'll pretend that was a pity book and you would get a quote from let's say Barnes and Noble and you would submit that purchase order to our office of purchasing the office of your, it's your funding string that you're identifying from your school budget to make that purchase but the Office of Purchasing has to apply it against one of our standing contracts. So they would look in the database and say, Barnes & Noble is an approved vendor for this type of purchase under contract JMI 61218. So that amount would come out of your fund, but be against this spending authority and on this spend report. So if this money is not allocated to the schools, how how is this $10 million ever spent? 
So this is the permission that we have to spend. So this, this spending authority says this is the most amount of money that we have permission to spend with these vendors. So some of that money is in CNI's budget for textbooks. So we have, as I mentioned, um, we've centralized our funds across the different departments within the division. Um, Title I has funds, schools have funds. So all told, if you take the funds that okay. each of our 175 schools have in our offices, that's where that number comes from. And it's an anticipated spending authority, which is why sometimes we come back for modifications because it depends on some of those pieces. And I just have a very, very quick question that popped into my head. How do we ensure, um, you know, that because schools have the discretion to maybe get a, a, an additional spe special educator or additional furniture, that some schools aren't spending their money on books and other schools are spending their money on something else. So there's a couple. Oh, go ahead, Dr. McComas. Oh well, I would I would just say I mean some of that is um, principal discretion, right? I mean so some of that is the conversations, some of the checks and balance. I think is what I hear you saying. Like how do we? Well, how well do no, we I mean just that we're we're purchasing value added products that are going to help our students' outcomes. And I'm not saying that comfortable furniture doesn't, right, right. but you know, I, I, and it might not even be a problem that exists. I'm just asking from an equity perspective. Sure, sure. I, I think there there are conversations and um, part of that working relationship between school executive directors who are the principal supervisors, right? They have conversations with principals about budget, how they're using their school budgets, what those resources are going to, and why is it that those are things that they need in their school? Um, and that conversation is, of course, anchored in the student need, right? When we look at student data, when we look at what are the needs of the children in this particular community or this particular school setting, what are the needs that the, the students have, and how is the principal leveraging those, those school budget dollars to address those needs of the students. So that's kind of in the largest concept that that's kind of part of that ongoing principal supervision and coaching conversation that happens um, between our school executive directors and the people they supervise. I think, Ms. Shea, you had some things I think you wanted to add as well, so I don't want to uh, I just would add the contract. office of. I'm sorry. I would just add the office of Title One as a big partner in this yeah. because that's the role of the Title One specialist assigned to the schools. So that's where a lot of the money is, and they have to actually, they being the principal's leadership team, mm -hmm. demonstrate how this purchase supports the goals of their plan, their school progress plan, as well as that. And they have a specialist from the office of Title One that's really charged with having that dialogue and ensuring, to your point. That because every dollar we spend on one thing is something that we're not spending somewhere else. So they really do engage in that prioritization of if you're, you know, per using it to purchase staff, how does that even that staff support your goals? Because while it seems like it's obvious that more teacher equals better, mm -hmm. you still have to have a plan for how you're utilizing that staff. So that's another avenue in addition in, and in partnership with the school EDs um, that our Office of Title I and our director, Michelle Stansbury, is fantastic at this, um, providing those supports for helping principals really make those um, best decisions and then monitoring the impact of those decisions if it's going to ever be continued. So so you can't just buy professional development. You have to demonstrate how that supports your school progress plan and then monitor the effectiveness of that choice. OK, thank you. That's it for my questions. Ms. Causey. Thank you and thank you for that presentation. And um, I guess um, following up with the um, line of question Ms. Mack was just talking about, there has been concern for years and uh, there's progress been made uh, but by the principals whose per pupil budget was cut severely, um, you know, let's say 2013, 2014, that time frame, um, maybe a little bit earlier. And, and um, the board and uh, superintendent have been making progress in adding that back. But if you have a school that has a tremendous amount of needs um, and they, you know, are spending their discretionary income on adult assistance or, you know, additional things that are going on um, there. In my mind, there should be some minimum level of textbooks uh, available to every school. Um, and so how are we and speaking to that point of equity? How are we 
making sure that that happens operationally. And I and I understand and appreciate the um, response thus far about the executive directors, and I agree they're you know working well and the Title One people, but. But overall, how are we making sure that that's possible? Because especially coming out of the pandemic, right. uh, they're finding the research is showing that uh, working with a textbook allows a child to be more focused, especially at a younger age um, when developing literacy is so important. So one thing I will offer, and then I, I don't, Ms. Dr. McComas probably wants to add to this too, but um, exactly for exactly the reason you just described, when we make a central curriculum purchase, that money does not come from the schools per pupil allocation. So that comes from central funds. So when we're buying math textbooks or ELA textbooks or phonics resources, that comes from centralized budgeting, either in Dr. McComas's central textbook account hence the three million that I referenced. Um, or in some cases, as you just recently saw, we come for a crest through the bat or, or through some other allocations. So when we're talking about textbooks specifically, that does not come from school funds, that comes from central funds for exactly the reason that you just described. Typically where school funds come into play are things like replacements. So if a, if a student has been given a math textbook or a physics textbook and they lose it, the school has a process by which they can get that money from the student. And then the, the school might say, I need to buy three more physics textbooks. Um, and then in some cases, same thing with novels. When we get approval for um, new culturally responsive novels or we're making changes, we make purchases based on the number of teachers and the number of students and differentiate by school. Where a school might make an additional purchase is, let's say they are working with their PTA and want to do a one book, one school initiative with their PTA, or maybe a particular teacher has a group of students that are really passionate about a particular author and they've decided to make a, a separate purchase. So it's usually those individual school purchases are supplemental. They are not expected to do that um, for anything that's core to the work. Much of what happens from the school purchases are things like special projects they're doing in their community, professional learning that the principals have opted. And then I just want to add to that, um, we've worked really hard in the last several years and, and um, principals will often hear Dr. McComas and I saying, um, we're, we're always going to support schools with their needs. Sometimes we have schools that aren't Title I that don't have those additional funds that have needs. So we've had, you know, a few years ago, a principal was um, lamenting the fact that her keyboard had broken and she didn't have funds in her school budget left because she didn't anticipate that the keyboard, then we're going to buy the keyboard. We're going to find, you know, money centrally to support your recess equipment. You know, my PE coordinator will will talk to schools all the time. So we're always in partnership with schools. Um, we're a large district. We're lucky to have the fiscal support from a, a board and from a county executive and hopefully county council to support that. We're never going to leave a school to say you can't do something instructional that you need to do because of funds. We're going to work collaboratively to help them do that. Well, thank you for all of that. And that leads me to my next question, which is um, during the pandemic, there was a, a, a rush to get materials into the hands of children. Um, and um, we're hearing that there's uh, been some issues with trying to relocate materials. Uh, is it possible that any of the CARES funding uh, would be available to pay for um, textbooks or materials that were lost during the pandemic? So I'll comment on that. Um, so as you know, Ms. Kazi. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so as you may know, when we submit applications for these uh, grants, right, because the, the CARES funds and all the succeeding um, series of ESSER funds, right, we have to submit an application outlining our intent of how to use those funds. And as time goes on, because these grants are multi-year, there's always that opportunity to amend the grant. And so, Ms. Causey, I think to your uh, question, I just offer that in every grant cycle, um, there's there's opportunity to amend the grant. Now, of course, when you're amending the grant, that means either you didn't spend the money as you had originally projected. Maybe things didn't cost as much or you didn't need to buy as many of whatever it was. Um, and you may have some residual funds that then you can, in the amendment, reallocate and redirect in a different uh, way. Um, so that's always a possibility with uh, these types of funds. I think what we would need to do is see exactly 
you know what the need is um, to, for in terms of replacement of whatever that item is, and then we'd have to look and say, is it uh, are there these uh, federal or these grant funds available? Is that the best place to use that replenishment funds, or is it something that's uh, minimal enough that maybe we would just absorb in the operating budget? So, uh, but just that any grant cycle tends to have that opportunity to amend uh, because. While you make your best laid plans, as we know in life, things sometimes um, zig when you anticipate they're going to zag. So, uh, so thank you for the opportunity. But yeah, every grant typically it's it's a rare grant that doesn't have an amendment opportunity within its cycle. And then typically a grant may end. Uh, let's just as an arbitrary example, let's say a grant ends June 30th. Typically in federal grants, you have a spend out period, which might be the next 90 days or so that anything that's still left in place, you can finish spending out uh, because their intention is for those dollars to go to the community in one way or another. So I hope that was helpful. Yes, thank you. My pleasure. Mr. Thomas, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you, Ms. Mack. Uh, my first question is, does this include some online books and online resources as well as physical resources? This particular contract uh, covers print materials and print materials. Material. Yep. OK, and when I've been visiting schools around the county and all throughout Halstead Academy and. Um, and. Uh, so it's an F, I for, I'm forgetting the, the name of the Fullerton? school. No, not Fullerton. No, it's in the East Zone or like Southeast Zone. With an F. No, it's not. Logan. No, Logan Elementary OK. School. Logan Elementary <laughs> School. Or L. For example, sorry. Okay. Um, you know, I'm talking to their librarians and I'm seeing them revamping their libraries and trying to make them more diverse and culturally responsive. And so is this the contract that um, purchasing those, making a more culturally responsive library would be under? Absolutely could be, yep. OK, awesome. Thank you so much. Yep, Follette is one of our big providers of some of our library titles and it's one of the vendors on this contract. Awesome. And I actually have a follow up question to that. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. So I, time is running away from me, but at some point we um, actually approved some books and I remember one of them was night, I, I think. So but that was a separate contract. So sometimes does, yes, sometimes no. So it's a great question. So um, that was not we we don't typically do separate contracts for individual novels. So you, we would often come to curriculum committee for approval for novels to be able to add them to our list of approved titles. Um, typically, this would be most often the contract that we would use for novel purchases. Um, it would be rare that we would have an individual contract for one novel title. So that OK, all right. I was I just remember I can remember exactly what the books look like on, yeah, on we the usually slide. put the covers of the titles on the slide. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. yes. Yep. Um, usually that's just for curricular approval and, and we describe the process by which we selected them. Um, but oftentimes those would be through this contract. That's where the spending authority would come from. OK, thank you. Um, may I have a motion to? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. And so earlier you were saying that no new items would be purchased that aren't, aren't already approved, but there are some items that these vendors provide that can be that the libraries can use that the board hasn't approved. Right, so um, I, I, what I was saying was that when we do a new curricular system wide purchase, that's not on this contract. So like when I came for bridges or illustrative math, that's a separate contract. A new title um, that can be approved would absolutely be applicable on this contract. Nice, and then I was going to ask, can you speak to some of the cultural inclusivity of some of the vendors that are on the list? I know you mentioned the one sure. that I thought um, so um, Barnes and Noble is one, AKJ, AKJ um, Wholesale, uh, the Book Rack is a local um, company that we use in Baltimore County. Um, some of the bigger publishers, like I mentioned, Follett, Heinemann, McGraw-Hill, Pearson, um, some of the textbook warehouses. So it enables schools also to sometimes get multiple quotes so that they can get the best price because sometimes a novel can be a better price in a different, and then other, um, Vendors have different bindings so that those novels last a little bit longer um, when in the hands of students. So there's a couple different, um, so which is why we have multiple vendors on the list. OK, thank you. Those are all my questions. Ms. Sure. Matt. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to approve JMI 61218? So move, Thomas. May I have a second, please? I will second it. Um, <laughs> Ms. Cox, may I have a roll call vote, please? Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Causey? 
I'm going to abstain for now. Miss, oh, Ms. go ahead, Miss Cox. I'm doing your job for you, <laughs> Mr. Thomas. Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. The motion passes. Um, and I think the next item, I have my papers all organized and now they're not anymore. Um, hold on. Miss Mack? Yes. I did the motion pass. I believe there are four members on the committee. There's only three members, two, three members here. So it's okay. a majority of the. I'm sorry, go ahead, Miss Causey. It's a majority of the right number of the members of the committee, not who's in the meeting. Uh, so it would not have passed and it would have to go to contracts without the recommendation of the curriculum committee. OK. OK, so if you would note that, Ms. Cox. Yes, I will. OK, thank you. And thanks for the clarification, um, Ms. Causey. And it looks like the next instructional material is the enrichment for our ELL students. Yes, thank you. Um, next slide, Mr. Corns. I am joined today by our director of ESOL, Ms. Jennifer Hernandez, and our coordinator of ESOL, Dr. Aaron Sullivan. Uh, we're very excited about this contract that we will be um, bringing forward as a part of our ongoing uh, multitude of efforts to support our multilingual learners. This particular contract will allow for extracurricular engagement and tutoring support. Um, so it uh, re partially replaces a previous contract that we had with Soccer Without Borders. You may remember we've brought that contract before. Um, Soccer Without Borders provides, of course, soccer and engagement and an extracurricular, but also provides tutoring services and after school extracurricular programming. Uh, currently, in, um, they offer it in the fall and spring at two of our middle school centers, Dundalk Middle on the east side and Lansdowne Middle on the west. Um, we sought to uh, a contract to be able to expand those offerings and in doing so we're also able to award the contract to another vendor um, that will also provide us with the ability to expand this offering to additional schools as well as expand tutoring services. So the other vendor um, specifically focuses on providing um, tutoring services in small groups as well as individual tutoring for our multilingual learners. Um, this is also a really important opportunity for us as we move forward with our our um, strategic plan to help return our multilingual learners to their home school of zone enrollment. We want to make sure that we have lots of additional supports in place. Um, some of these extracurricular resources will be used in the summer at some of our high school um, summer programs at our current centers, um, as well as I mentioned the ongoing support at our middle schools. Dr. Sullivan or Ms. Hernandez, anything that you wish to add before we turn it over to questions? I was just going to add, um, thank you, Ms. Shea. That was great that the tutoring piece also will help students with uh, moving toward um, receiving additional support toward earning the Maryland Seal of Biliteracy. Thank you. Dr. Sullivan, anything you want to add? The additional tutoring support, we're able to target different um, English learners because English learners are a very diverse group. So we have a growing number of SIFE students, students with interrupted formal schooling, and so we'll be able to provide some critical one-on-one -on -one tutoring for those students. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Mr. Thomas, looked like you had a question. Yes. So my question is, is it the Soccer's Without Borders? Is that what this contract is about? Is that providing? Is that what's providing the tutoring services or? There are two vendors that this contract will be awarded to, but Soccer Without Borders not only does soccer, but they also do tutoring. They do both. Awesome. And so there is a second vendor that just does And there is a second vendor that I don't know if they play soccer, but they mostly focus on <laughs> the tutoring. <laughs> awesome. Um, and how are we choosing the schools that this would go to? And are, they, are the schools going to be expanded besides just Dunlop Middle and Lansdowne Middle um, with this contract? So I'll start and then I'll invite Dr. Sullivan or Ms. Hernandez. Um, so we have right now a center model for our secondary students. And so um, we started with, um, we have um, our middle schools are Dundalk and Lansdowne so that we would have one on each side on the west and the east um, of our centers. And so in terms of expansion, um, we would continue to expand um, to the current centers. But then as we 
uh, return students to their homeschool of enrollment. Part of that plan is about where we have a large number of students that are either have currently waived service um, or are returning to that community so that we can have the service follow where those students are returning home um, to some of those schools. So Dr. Sullivan or Mr. Hernandez, anything you want to add to that? Oh, okay. I answered it right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so could some students that are say in the central zone, um, in term with EO, EO students in the central zone, could they go to these after school programs at Lanza Middle and uh, Dunlop Middle School, even though they're not enrolled at that school, or is it just for the students at that school? So the um, I'll let Dr. Sullivan talk to soccer, but the tutoring services will be able to expand to, to multiple schools, so they'll be able to access the tutoring services. We do not currently transport students to come play in the after school soccer program. That's reserved for the current students currently enrolled in those schools. But in terms of accessing the tutoring services, we have the ability working through our ESOL teachers um, at the school to, to pair students up with those services. And please, Dr. Sullivan, I saw you started to respond, so go ahead. Well, and the 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 contract that we're the vendor that we're adding hey tutor also allows for both um virtual and face-to-face -face tutoring nice. um, which we have found um for some of our students the virtual is really important um and so that so that will allow us to get to students kind of across the district as well um in particular with the seal the support for the seal of biliteracy we could reach kids who, you know we might have um one Urdu speaker in the north and one in the south, we could bring them together and be more more efficient with our support for them. That's an incredible. Um, and I had another question, but I, it'll come back to me as other people are asking questions. I, I forgot it. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions just because they piggyback a little bit on Mr. Thomas's questions. How does this differ from I thought some of this was included in both the contract for our community schools and the contracts for our extended year learning, um, tutoring. I know we have a, a grant out right now for tutoring. How is this different? Go ahead, Dr. Sullivan. So when we did the request for the proposal, we wanted to make sure that these um, that whoever applied and, and through our review process had the expertise and the experience in working with multilingual learners. Our experience sometimes with um, our vendors is that they have great experience in their area, but they haven't worked with our population. And so what was really important to us is to bring people in who are working, who have that experience. Um, because sometimes what we have to do is then train those vendors to work with specifically with our population or give them resources. Both of these um, organizations are poised to do the, you know, they they have people um, who speak multiple languages. They already reach out and access. Sock Without Borders entire mission is to work with immigrant and refugee students. So that's a little bit different than some some of the other tutoring companies who may not have that expertise working with this specific population. Well, that was, you answered my next question. Um, how effective can the tutoring be or the services provided if teachers can't work effectively with the many, many different types of, you know, students? Um, and I know like an ESOL teacher does not a, a traditional ESOL teacher does not have to speak the languages of the students with whom he or she works. But um, if we're paying a vendor, I, I'm glad to hear, I'm, I'm answering your my question for myself, <laughs> that we have teachers, they will have teachers who will be able to engage with our students in the lang their native languages. And coaches as well. Many of those coaches were former refugees or, or immigrants. Um, so that they have not only the language background, but the SEL, like knowing what it's like to be in their situation. And then my last question is, what percentage of the tutoring do you foresee as being face-to-face -face tutoring versus online tutoring? Because you mentioned utilizing BCPS ESOL teachers, but, you know, they have limited time and... Uh significant case Let me clarify that part. That was um, the ESOL teachers help us pair the students. So it was oh, okay. the service the tutors. I was saying that we could leverage our relationships to find these students that would benefit from it. So they just help us to connect them with this service. They're not actually the ones that we're hiring. Um, oh, okay. Service. So then my question is what percentage would be face-to-face -face tutoring versus 
online tutoring? So Sac Without Borders, the, the summer program and the um, year long program at the middle school will be face to face. During the pandemic, I will say one of the great things was they stayed with us and we stayed virtual with them all all year long. And you, we all remember the struggle of like devices and getting connected. And so they were like another group that were helping our students, particularly at Dundalk. Um, but now that we're back, they the majority of their work will be face to face. We are adding a college access piece for a small number of students for seniors, and that will be virtual. So that will be for a very small number of students. For the Hey Tutor, the plan is um, to do virtual for content and virtual for um, the world languages for the seal of biliteracy. Again, because of our ge geography, we think it might be easier. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to fill those spots better if we are open to the whole county. Um, but the the face to face will be for our SIFE students, our students with interrupted formal schooling, and that will be face to face. So um, that that part that the cost per pupil is a lot higher for that because they will be coming and working one on one with students face to face. And that's really because we think that that need is so great for the students who have that um, considerable gaps in their education. And some of my questions are prompted by the fact that I did. Um mock interviews at a high school with a, a tremendous uh, amount of diversity. And when I would ask students, what's the biggest challenge you faced? Many of them talked about the challenge of coming to a country, not knowing the language, not knowing the culture, not fitting in, being expected to get an education. And many of them talked about like, a, you know, one person who became their support person. And I just wanted to make sure that there is an opportunity to create those human relationships. So thank you for that answer. Ms. Causey, did you have any questions? Thank you to um, everyone for this presentation. This is such a, a vital importance to our, our students and our um, families and communities. Um, I appreciate also Mr. Thomas and Ms. Mack's question because they asked um, similar ones to mine. Um, I did have a question is how is um, how is this information going to get out to students and teachers and counselors, um, especially around the seal of biliteracy aspect? Because I also, um, you know, really enjoyed going to mock interviews at high schools and met a number of students who are bilingual, uh, but in their native language, they aren't, um, you know, they aren't you know, at the AP level class or they're not even taking that native language, um, but clearly by um, becoming um, proficient in English along with their native language, they really have the opportunity to get that seal of biliteracy. So um, if you could speak a little to that. Thank so, you for that question. Do you want to yeah. take it, Erin, or do you want me to? You can, Jen, if you want. Do you want to start with the ASL? Part well, so what I would, and, yeah, so it is yeah. a joint collaboration between the Office of World Languages and the Office of ESOL um, because we need both both teachers and both offices to really um, work together. For in, in the Office of ESOL, well, one, we're, we ha have been lucky that the board has funded um, ESOL counselors. So at the five centers, we have ESOL high school counselors who my office meets with regularly and talks about initiatives that are specific to the English learner population, um, bring resources. Our last meeting we talked about Afghan arrivals and additional resources they may need. So we do have a direct line to those ESOL counselors. So that is, you know, we work together with the counseling office. So that is great. Um, and then we work a lot through our DCs as well. So we work with our DCs to identify students who um, and then Jen has done a lot of work on with a technical solution too to identify students who are candidates for the seal of biliteracy. Um, so she she can yeah. probably speak more to that. Yeah, so we have a third party assessment called the Apple assessment that tests in all four domains of language and we use that as a data point. Um, we also look in the elevation um, platform to so that we can triangulate some data around those students. Um, we have done a lot of coaching with our department chairs 
in terms of identification of students who should be or could be eligible to move toward the seal and what types of supports they need. When they take that um, the Apple assessment that I just mentioned, they receive a complete diagnostic. So the teachers then go from that point of the diagnostic to look at what skills in the four domains of language we can help build um, with the students. And then we do a lot with just the informational side. So we have translated um, documents and materials about the seal of biliteracy and then posters have been provided for schools so that there is conversation about that and um, we also have a Schoology page set up that talks about the seal of biliteracy, the count to date, um, and some of the goals that we set with students to help them moving uh, forward toward earning the seal. And then we also, with our um, native and heritage Spanish speakers, look at appropriate placement in the pipeline from middle to high school if they need a heritage speakers course to help transition them then toward an AP track. So we're looking at all of those variables. And again, it's a it's great for me in my role because I work with ESOL and World Languages, so it's been a really nice joint venture for both offices. We also and had an opportunity to present to at least one of our advisory councils, and we love to be in the two, actually. We were at Central and Southwest, so that's another avenue <laughs> for about getting the word out um, to share with directly with families about opportunities for their students. Well, and that's where I learned so much about it. So thank you yeah, for that. Oh, that's right. Central, right <laughs> very yeah. advisory, and so when I was in this mock interview with uh, with the student, I was able to say, go to your counselor and find out how you can right. um, try and get qualified to do this as a junior, still has time. Mm -hmm. um, and another student was um, uh, proficient in their native language, which is not offered mm -hmm. at BCPS. Yeah. And currently. we have so about 800 SEALs earned to date in the system. So that's that's really significant. That's something uh, we're and to your point about a language that's not offered, that's what we're trying to help and support with this. So like we have students who are proficient early speakers, but we wouldn't have a proficient English speaker take an assessment without giving them support, right? So this will help us to be able to start supporting kids who deserve to get the seal of biliteracy, but may need some support in the with the assessment. Right, that's great. And plus, as we're talking about preparing our students for the future and careers to have that seal, it, it, it is really very incredible because we know that our, um, you know, our county, our state, our country is increasingly global diverse. And so it, it's going to be uh, a, a marketable skill to have that. So absolutely. And, I, and the other question was, um, are we spending enough money on this contract? <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard Ms. Did you say that again, that. Ms. Cosby? Can <laughs> we write that down? <laughs> I, I have said that before. Yeah. But anyway, I thought I would phrase I know. the we question appreciate in the positive. <laughs> we well, appreciate that. So on that note, may I have a motion to approve LLY 42722? So move, Thomas. May I have a second, please? Second. But can I ask how much the contract is for? Sure. It's or roughly two million dollars. I said that okay. right, right, guys? It's two million. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Cox, I may have a roll call vote, please. Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Okay, that passes. Thank and you. finally, we're going to go to item F CTE supplies and equipment. And we are six minutes ahead of schedule, Ms. Shea, so I will turn it over to you. I'm sure I can ruin that in a hurry. No, I'm kidding. I'll be good. Next slide, please, Mr. Corns. Um, so this is a um, contract that we are bringing forward. It's a new contract for a prototype prototype design, engineering, manufacturing, and construction equipment and supplies for the Office of Career and Technology. Um, this is um, exciting opportunity. As you know, this will provide specifically for equipment such as 3D printers, laser engraving systems, um, fused de deposition modeling 3D printers, and as well as um, CNC machines. So we use these in a number of our programs that we have in um, almost, I think it's 17 out of our 26 high schools. Um, so these programs include engineering programs as well as our graphic design programs and our construction management programs. Um, and so we, when we come for the contract, we're going to be seeking a spending authority of $550,000. And that's based on an annual procurement of about 110,000, which is what we use on a cycle to replace 
replace equipment that is either becoming aging or when we have new programs. So, you know, for example, in our innovation grant, we're working on a program for artificial intelligence that we're very excited about. Um, that program would have some equipment and then what will happen is we'll use our Perkins funding um, to have a refresh cycle. So we'll use this over the next five years to provide equipment. Um, part of the um, contract process was also making sure that the equipment that we're putting in our programs is of industry standard. So we want to make sure that we're training our students to actually use the equipment that they will use in the careers that we're preparing them for. Um, and Ms. Mack, in particular, I know you often ask about professional learning. So in this contract, not only will we have the materials but every August we do safety training on the equipment so this will include opportunities for any teachers that will uh, be teaching programs that use this equipment um, to also receive that hands-on safety training annually as well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a quick question about this and I, I don't know if it's appropriate to pull Mr. Corns into this but one of the concerns that was raised by some CTE teachers to me and I brought it up in a board meeting was um, the fact that using laptops in some of these labs did not allow for us to adequately use um, things like Adobe, just different Adobe products. Are we sure that how these are gonna be used, that we have the bandwidth to allow each of these things to be used well and efficiently? So thank you for that question. And I certainly would invite Mr. Corns because we have been partners. This has been a long road. And so the teachers are not wrong that this has been challenging, especially since the ransomware. And I know we're all sort of tired of talking about the ransomware, but it did have a, a lasting impact. And so we've been working to rebuild um, some of what you're referencing or some of the peripherals. So because the software um, or a desktop, an old desktop that they had been using to run the peripheral was no longer able to be used or re-imaged following the ransomware, it did present some challenges. Uh, we've been working hand in hand, the CTE office with um, DOIT and, and under Mr. Corn's leadership um, to, to try as much as possible to restore, to use different models, um, including Intune to access the software that they would need. Adobe's been a big one. We've been working really hard to restore um, some of our 3D modeling software. So the question about these particular contracts, part of our contract process is ensuring that we have the ability to integrate. And so we do work hand in hand when we're bringing forward any new contract to make sure that we're able to actually use it in the classroom. So some of what you're describing was a result of an impact. Um, we had been using it well. We lost access based on um, some of the after effects of the ransomware. We've been working really hard to restore it. Um, moving forward with a new purchase, that be, that is a part of the process to make sure that we're going to have with it the ability to, to actually use the materials that we're purchasing. Um, Mr. Corns, is there anything that you would want to add to that? Be still on. Uh, yeah, Ms. Shea, th thank you for uh, kicking over. Ms. Mack, here's the, the, the piece about these particular supplies as well. These are high-end uh, printers, uh, most of them not necessarily networkable, but uh, extended print jobs. Like there are instances of 3D printing that take hours and hours and hours. And so the model that we would follow with this would be the printer connected to a dedicated, dedicated computer. Print that would allow that dedicated computer to drive that printer and then the creation of the material uh, would be done by the student and then the file transferred to that that dedicated machine in order to implement the printing of it so the idea that an individualized student's computer would connect directly to this printer as a network feature or as a plug-in feature would actually be uh, prohibited by the way the device actually functions and um, Ms. Causey put in the chat just to re remember okay. too, that last contract did allow for that purchase for the desktops that were in those labs, as well as the dedicated computer for these equipment. Well, I am sure everybody on this call knows that I am technologically challenged, so I am way above my grade level here, but I did have conversations and, you know, what we have is great stuff, but if if it times out before it gets to the printer. So I just want to make sure that approving this contract when it hits the school system, when it hits all of the high schools that this is where, where this will go, that it's going to be able to be used seamlessly. Right. That's that's sure. Yes. And, and Mrs. Mack, that comment about uh, timing out just to to give uh, some some clarity. Um, these these printers, these they're 
they're very customized and very specific. They're not generating paper, but 3D modeling and, oh, no. and part right. of things. Yeah, so they're actually directly connected to the computer via a cable that is not a networked cable. So the idea of like sending a file and it gets halfway there and fails, that's not actually in, within this gambit here. This would be the file shows up on the computer, the computer itself runs that, and the computer that is dedicated to that printer would control that job. So I don't feel that the, there would be a concern with that, that timeout issue. And, and I believe that working with CTE, we do have a very um, stable uh, deployment model for these types of devices. I'm happy to hear that. And I'm sorry to pull you into the meeting, Mr. Korn, but Miss <laughs> <laughs> um, Causey, do you have any questions? Yes, um, thank you for the presentation and thank you for um, your your questions as well. Um, one, I am curious what the dollar value is because I believe this is a new um, contract that was. It is a new contract. The spending authority, I apologize, I thought I mentioned is 550,000. The equipment okay. that we're talking about purchasing can range anywhere from 6,000 to 24,000. So then that would impact the number of um, purchases we make each year. So they estimated roughly $110,000 a year for the five years. OK, great. And um, so this was a new competitively bid. Yes. OK, thank you. And then um, related to CTE and a comment you made earlier about schools receiving the support that they need to support their educational programs. Um, Hereford High School is the only high school out of the 24 that has a dedicated agricultural uh, program with a CTE com completer. And uh, currently we're in the process of um, finishing um, improvements to the historic barn. And then um, the principal and the staff there had really wanted to move forward with a new barn for the uh, animals that are really uh, vital to this program. So um, I had seen in one of our updates about a grant that was being submitted um, up for an agricultural program, and I wanted to understand where that uh, was um, headed, if that would, those funds could be used for a barn, just kind of what the yes. sequence of that is. So I think um, Dr. McComas is going to answer that first, and then I'll chime yeah, in. And then certainly, you know, we're... Um, a tag, tag team, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. So um, yes, Ms. Kazi, and we were very excited. You know, this is a, a found opportunity at which we are grateful for with the Maryland Leeds grant. And so we have submitted um, as part of our grant application uh, for that um, uh, related to both the design and the construction uh, to support that specific CTE program. Um, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Shea because she was um, instrumental as, as the CTE team in helping us craft the actual uh, request in that application. We are waiting to hear if that application is approved in part or in whole. Um, so we, I will keep you informed because we are excited to to be able to take care of that program because it is the the only program that we currently have in the school system related to agriculture. So, and and what I would add is yes, we've submitted the grant funds for the design and um, construction of an agricultural learning lab beyond just a barn. We're also besides protecting, I think it's Dolly and maybe Sue, uh, who we got a chance to meet. Um, we also have purchased um, a farm bot equipment, so we're actually taking this into uh, the future and helping our students to understand their future in um, agriculture. And then we have long range plans about how we might expand this to other parts of the county that might not have the same uh, geography and, and approach farming in the same way, but we know that there are um, expansions happening all the time with urban and vertical farming. And, and we're really excited about how this could hopefully become a state of the art um, facility that then we can use to help us model expanding those opportunities. We're a farming state and we want our students to be able to have those opportunities um, well into the future. So we're excited. Our fingers are crossed. Um, we just submitted the grant just before um, spring break, so we haven't heard anything yet, but um, send all your positive vibes and crossed fingers uh, to help. And, and uh, would it help to take a picture of our um, currently homeless? Our poor, mini, cool mini cows. Well, she's she's I, know, I even offered to do a dumps. dairy on our food, our CTE food truck. I was like, we might even be able to add ice cream to the food truck menu if we do this well. So they seem to like the ice cream idea. So we'll see, hopefully. And right. just okay. for um, Ms. Kelsey, I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity to see the agricultural um, learning 
lab, if you will, at uh, North Hartford High School, but that's a, a an example locally of a more modern um, prototype. So, uh, so we are excited and hopeful that our grant application will be approved, hopefully in, in its entirety. So, right now, I haven't been there personally. I know um, the principal and leadership and staff at um, Hereford High School have been there, and I, you know. They advised me about it. I looked it up online, and so certainly we want to provide those that level of um, innovative um, environments to our students. And thank you, Ms. Shea, for pointing out the advances related to the uh, STEM aspects of agriculture that many people just don't realize. Sure. Um, so it's um, uh, it's very exciting to hear. Please, please keep me posted, and if you need a photograph of our little homeless mini bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Shivering in the rain. Just let me know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Will do. I apologize. My husband decided to cut the grass right at the end of the meeting. So <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Um, I'm going to mute. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, does this contract include the cost for a filament that would be used for the 3D printer, or that come in through a separate contract? Um, so I will say both and. So it can be applied to this contract and we do have other contracts that talk more generally about CTE supplies. So it would really depend on the pricing structure and availability. So it could, but it could also be um, applied to a couple of other equipment and materials contracts we have that support CTE. Okay, and I'm thinking back to my experience with our 3D printers in BCPS in ninth grade in my computer science class and also in seventh grade in my um, engineering class. And I'm wondering, um, one of the things that on my student device was I was able to use Google SketchUp and other platforms and then send it to my teacher who would then use the official device to print yep. out the, the process. So is that, will that be able to continue with the use of, with Chromebooks? That, that's exactly what um, Mr. Corns was describing. So students will not be um, sending it directly from their device, but we would have a dedicated device similar to the way that you described. So all the students would have access to Google SketchUp or whatever platform they're using for the design. And then the dedicated printer would be, uh, dedicated computer would be what the teacher would use to um, actually print. Awesome, thank you so much. Yep. So it sounds like I'm not going to have trouble get, um, having somebody make a motion to approve GDA 319-22. So, so move, Pause. Second. <laughs> Jinx. Ms. Cox, may I have a roll call vote, please? Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. So the motion passes. Um, are there any other items? 328, Miss Mac. I didn't think I would do it, but we did it. That's because my husband's cutting the grass and it's getting louder and louder. Um, <laughs> Thank you all very much. So um, before we adjourn, just want to say our next meeting is Thursday, May 19th um, at two o'clock. And I hope that the weather stays nice and everybody gets a chance to enjoy it before it snows again. Bye, everybody. Thank you very, very much for all your work. Bye. Thank you for your time you. today. As always, the best committee. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you.